All right, thank you all. Glad to see you that you're here tonight. Anybody have a crazy day today? My toilet broke down. Say amen right there. That was a wild afternoon. We had an emergency in Auburn. Did you hear about it? We had a water main break. That's what the secretary, that's what the desk lady said. I thought they were going to blame the toilet on COVID. Amen. Everything's COVID related. But that, but that was two days in a row. Last night, a quarter to 11, I'm sitting in my hotel room. It's 79 degrees, according to the thermostat, in my room. And my uh, air conditioner was as worthless last night as my toilet was this afternoon. Say amen right there. So I got on the phone and called the desk, and the lady said, Oh, I said, you got any maintenance people here? She said, Well, they don't come on till 11. I don't know why they don't have 3 to 11. It's a sharp motel, I'm telling you, neighbor. And I wish I didn't have a conviction against mixed bathing. I'd have dove into that pool by now. Amen. Nice place. But uh, 11 o'clock is when they come on, she said. I said, well, can you have the dude call me as soon as he gets in here? I'm baking in here. So 11.15, the phone hadn't rang yet, so I called again. This time a man's voice answered. Hello. And uh, long story short, I said, hey, he said, how, how, how's everything going? He said, I, well, I'm okay. So how's, how's my maintenance man doing there now there? He said, I'm waiting on a call. Oh, he's not here tonight. <laughs> I said, the gal told me he's coming in at uh, 11 o'clock. She said, oh, no, he won't be back till Wednesday. Now, I want to be a typical dumb Baptist and, you know, drama queen. A little voice said, you better be nice. And before I could slip up and say something ugly, that's what they say in North Carolina. I don't want to be ugly. The guy said, yeah, Brother Grady, I, I can come up and check. I, Pastor Grady, I can come up and check on it for you. Real nice voice. And I said, Pastor Grady, who the heck's calling me Pastor Grady? 99% of you ought to know who I'm talking about, right? Who am I talking about? Yeah. And the first thought I had was, man, am I glad I didn't get ugly. <laughs> Isn't that funny? You never know who. You never know, neighbor. God will sneak up on you, man. And long story short, he came up there. And the funniest thing was, you, you, tell me you do not want me to describe what I look like when he came to the door. Please. Okay? Tell me you don't want me, because I'm not going to. All I'll do is I'll tell you what I told him. I said, Jack Howes used to tell us as preachers in training, he said, don't be afraid to let your people know you have feet of clay. Just don't take your shoes off too often, amen. <laughs> well, you, would, you wouldn't believe the outfit I was wearing when he came in the room. He, they used to say, don't, don't lose your mystique as a leader. You know, man, I, I'd have lost it last night with that dude. I'm telling you, neighbor. <laughs> all right, I had a wild night. Okay, so you all pray for me. This is my ninth time to be speaking in seven days in a row, and I only have 31 more speaking engagements to go before the month's over. So... You know, you kids will pray for Brother Grady. I know polka dots will and the rest of you. But some of you adults, I wouldn't mind your prayers. And you owe me some prayers right down there. I finally found a widow who's been hiding out all since the meeting started. I got a book to her. And so uh, if you're a widow, you get a free book. It offers good through tomorrow night. Say amen right there. Have a sense of humor. Amen. All right. So I appreciate your prayers through the month of June, if you don't mind thinking of me. Now, uh, tonight we're going to have a very unusual service. I told you that. Tomorrow night is my key message on the state of Israel. I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a book that took me 16,000, 18,000 hours to compile. And I'm going to summarize it in one hour and a half or 20 minutes or whatever. And you're not going to believe what you're going to hear tomorrow. It's just how it works. And uh, have, I, have I let anybody down yet? Give, give me something. Give me something. Has it been interesting? Yeah. All right. All right. You know, I was in Boyne City, Michigan the other day preaching a Wednesday night through Sunday. And uh, you know, I was acting goofy like I normally do doing this while I'm preaching. A lady came in the first night, sat on the back row. She's from Boston, Massachusetts. This is a Boyne City, Michigan by the UP. She's a lifetime uh, Episcopalian. Now, somebody said an Episcopalian is a Catholic who flunked Latin, amen? So she's, she's just checking everything out. She ran a dry cleaning business in town, and one of their, her employees was a member of the church. Invited her to come to the meeting. So she's in there looking around, you know. And then, but she sees me doing this every five minutes. And she thought I was being genuine, you know. I'm just doing, hey, you Protestants, get off the grass. I just do that crazy thing to hold the attention of the people. And the Lord used that dumb thing for her to zero in on me. And listen, 
until she got under conviction. We tag teamed off from the devil, you know, to the Holy Spirit. And she got under conviction, came to the altar, the invitation, got saved, came back Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday, same man right there. Told me later, she thought, I, was, I thought you were being serious. You know, there was, two, there was two farm boys over there in Iowa, you know, in the only Catholic church in town. You know, they were spooked out about it. They heard all kind of weird things going on in there, you know. And finally, the one kid said, I'll tell you what, if you stay out here and keep an eye out for stuff, I'll go and sneak in there during Mass, hide under a pew, and tell you what happened. So the one kid said, okay, go ahead. And Sunday morning Mass, the other kid sneaks in, you know, like a spy. He comes out about 45 minutes later. His eyes were about that big. And his friend said, man, what in the world did you see in there, man? You look like you saw a ghost. He said, it was crazy, bro. He said, one half of the room stood up and chanted, my father can beat you in dominoes. And then the other side stood up and said, no, he can't. And then the other side said, my father can beat you in dominoes. And then the other side stood up again and said, no, he can't. Then a third time, my father can beat you in dominoes. No, he can't. He said, and then it took six Irishmen to pick up the bits. <laughs> <laughs> man, them Catholics don't pass an offering plates, eh, man? They got, it, they, got it, they got the basket on the pole ministry. Amen, Brother Grady. Now, let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you tonight what happened on January 18th. I think that's the date of Wednesday when Biden moved in and Trump's moved out that morning. And I, all preachers and ministries are different, right? Uh, I don't, I don't uh, zero in on unsaved people in revival type salvation sermons. If you got lost people here and I know it, I'll, I'll come after them. I'm not here to teach you how to build a, build a church. I'm not here for leadership conference. I mean, there's all kinds of people doing all kinds of things. I'm sure not here to tell you about evolution and all that. Uh, I, my job is to tell you what's going on. And that's what I know best. And uh, so that's my job tell you what's happening. I'm going to show you tonight in a visual aid that you'll never forget what happened on January the 18th in this country, okay? That's all we're going to do tonight. So why don't we stand with our Bibles open to 1 Timothy chapter number 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And let me say again how much fun I've been having this week. Had a wonderful meal tonight. Met a lot of nice dogs all week. It's at least three fun dogs. I love, I'm a dog lover. I had a nice time. Thank you for being so good to us. I'm here and, and tomorrow one more night. And we'll have a good time tomorrow. Now, you got your Bible? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 1. You can read along as I read it out loud. You can read it, look at, read it to yourself. Verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. And if you remember running into any pious Baptists uh, right before the 2016 election that didn't like the idea of voting for Trump, uh, they didn't like the way he says stuff. <laughs> you like the way Biden says it better? <laughs> But uh, one of the things they said, preacher, I remember was, uh, we hear he has con con uh, connections with the mafia. I think I mentioned this Sunday morning. He, he has connections with organized crime in New York. Uh, uh, how do you build skyscrapers in Manhattan, as I mentioned Sunday morning, without knowing which palms you got to grease? What do you want, a good Baptist in there like Jimmy Carter or Bill Clinton again? And, but what those dipstick Baptists didn't understand is, if you want to know what a qualification is for a pastor, you go to chapter 3 and read that. Starting in verse 1. Right. Chapter 2 is for the qualifications for your political leaders. You're right. and, you, you, and you might be shocked to see there's not even one there. Just the benefit if you get a good one. That you may lead a quiet and peaceful life. Verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Who will have all men to be saved. And to come unto the knowledge of the truth. By the way, the greatest verse you'll ever throw on a Roman Catholic if he's, if he's open and he's kind of open to be you know, you know, influenced is probably the next verse. It knocks out about five major Catholic doctrines and, and it's in the Catholic Bible if you, if, if you have access to one, if he's afraid of your King James Bible. For there is, or, or the next couple of verses, 
Well, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Well, it blows out the priesthood. It blows out Mary. It blows out the saints. I used to pray to my mother. I, I baptized her on the deathbed, thought she went to heaven. I, I used to pray to her. Verse 6 blows out all the Calvinists you ever want to meet. Who gave himself a ransom for the elect. Amen. I think it says to all. Amen, Brother Greedy. All right. All right. Well, let's have a word of prayer and get underway. Father, we sure do love you. Thank you for being so good to us. And thank you for giving me so much liberty here. What an enjoyable week it's been for me. But Father, these folks have been faithful to be in their place every service. And we're laying out a lot of heavy stuff on them. And give them good edification tonight. Pastor can't teach them everything. That's why you have special speakers to come in, Lord. What you, what's, what's that old saying, Lord? A pastor is a shepherd that makes the evangelist the sheep, though. Pastor comforts the, sh the, the uh, sheep. The, and the, uh, the uh, pastor comforts the uh, 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 exhort. Lord, I'll get it later on. Remind me how that goes later, Lord. Bless the people tonight now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm stuttering up here. The, uh, shep the, uh, the, the shepherd, the pastor comforts the afflicted, and the evangelist afflicts the comforted. Isn't that a good verse? What do you mean verse? Well, that's in Maccabees somewhere. All right, stay with me now. <clears throat> All right. We started off in Sunday school talking about how God was going to enlarge Japheth, right? Now, when you saw the Alexander the Great scenario, and finally the Europeans got control of the world, that's when Japheth finally got enlarged physically and the European continent and uh, became the powerhouse of, of the world and never has changed since. Well, that's not what God just wanted, you know, to, for white men to consume their strength on their lust. That's not what God had in mind. God had in mind getting the gospel around the world. The sun never sets on the British Empire. You already read about those famous British missionaries that went all over the world, amen. William Carey went to India and translated the Bible into about 40-something dialects. You know these stories. Where do you think those people came from? They came from the land of that book right there. Where, that's that British King James Bible. That's where it come out of, British Isles. Now this is, again, you'll never see these racial issues the right same way if you see it from a Bible perspective. That's all. And um, if you think God's a racist, well, he's a racist by, by, uh, by the dictionary definition, and so is everybody in this room. If everybody in this room believes that God enlarged Japheth above his two brothers, you are racist. You think I'm kidding? Go take, take some time out and go check stuff out. Go get a dictionary. You, anybody have it, not have access to a dictionary? Go read it. I look at this stuff. You know what it says about a ra what racism is? If you think one race is superior or inferior to another race, you are racist. Well, I'm telling you, neighbor, if you think you can outfox a Jew when it comes to money. You got mental problems, amen? God, God gave that Jew something he didn't give you. you know, the races are not all the same. If you believe that, you're on quaaludes. And uh, God did something with Japheth that he did not do with Shem and Ham. And if you believe that, you're a racist. That's all there is to it. That's like a loaded question. When somebody says to you, don't forget you got to pray for me. When somebody says to you, uh, blah, 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 have you quit beating your wife? Yes or no? See that? What if you're not beating your wife? Yes or no? That's how they get you in a courtroom. That's a loaded question. Now you got to understand this stuff. God raised up Japheth so, as the elder brother so he could get the gospel to his other two brothers and get the gospel around the world. So now by, by when you get to Acts 16 from last night, if you were not here last night, a very key passage, when you get to Acts 16, the apostle Paul lands in Europe. Remember that? For the first time. Where does he touch his foot on European soil for the first time? Acts 16.11. How's that for a coinky dinky You couldn't beat that with a stick, amen. And, uh, and, and, and after that's going to come the books of Corinthians and Thessalonians, Thessalonians, I mean, and the book of Romans, and all them pagan Gentile uh, Europeans, all those white people, are getting the gospel that the Asians had had ever since they were called Christians first in Antioch. God's moving out to enlarge Japheth spiritually now. He's already been enlarged physically. Now he's got to get infused with the gospel. And then ultimately we're going to get to the King James Bible world over in London. And then you're going to see it's going to come over to America. And then boom, you're going to have a Statue of Liberty in, the, 
in New York Harbor after a while. And then everybody's going to want to come here for some reason. Duh. Maybe God knows what he's doing. What do you think? I, he probably knows more than Black Lives Matter knows. I'll get you... A, I, I guarantee he probably does. And I told you from day one, I don't care if you get mad at me or not, that King J's Bible could be true. All right, neighbor. Are you getting tight again? How many, how many getting tight again? Raise your hand. Go read Titus. Amen. Titus chapter 1. All right, now watch. You see this microphone stand right here? This is going to represent the church of Jesus Christ uh, right here, okay? Now right here is Acts 16.11. Here's the first time the gospel of the grace of God touches European soil, right? Four verses later, the first Europeans are going to be saved. A, a business woman, business lady named Lydia. I was over there in Israel, uh, Poland doing research for my chapter on a, on a Holocaust there in the Israel book, and I hired me a Polish lady guide and uh, gave her a big tip, amen, on top of whatever in the world I had to charge, pay, pay for her services. I gave her a big $50 tip when we were done because I wanted to witness to her. And people will listen to you more when you put a few bucks in their hands, amen. They say, you know, money talks and nobody walks, amen. But her name was Lydia. Still remember. And I said, Lydia, you know, the first European that was ever saved. She's a Catholic woman who wouldn't know what I was talking about. She, she was named after you, amen. I told her name Lydia. Okay, now here's where Paul lands up here in Acts 16. And he got the Philippian jailer and Lydia and all that crowd. First Europeans ever being saved, right? All right, now watch this neighbor. And, and by, by, okay, now watch. That's, that's about 56, 57 AD, something like that. Now watch this. This is a timeline going that way. Let's move it up here, look. 64 AD. That's where Paul wrote that verse we just read. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, right? For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a what? Quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Is that what it says? Right there is where Paul told Timothy, write this down, you exhort the brethren to pray for that. Right? Is that hard to read in English? That we may have a quiet, pray for all that are in authority. That we may have lead a quiet and peaceable life. Kabish. Okay. Look. Look at here. We're going to go one year. Look. 65 AD. God who wrote that to Timothy had his head whacked off. I guess he never saw what he asked him to pray about, did he? Get your head whacked off. That's not a quiet and peaceful life, is it? Okay, neighbor. Let's keep on a moving here. Look. Between here and you get over to here to 90 AD. Here's where the Apostle John is on the island of Patmos. He's the only apostle left alive. You know what happened to all the rest of them? Got wiped out. You know, like wiped out? What do you mean wiped out? Wiped out. Executed. Martyred. Hey, anybody remember this prayer back here? What's the matter with God? Do you know what he's doing? I, I, ain't nobody had any quiet and peaceful life. John was boiled in oil in the Colosseum according to a very strong Christian tradition. And all of a sudden, he's in there for 30 minutes and, he, and you know he's supposed to be toast by now. He pops out and says, can I get a milkshake? <laughs> They, they about freaked out. From what I've read, this is not inspired Bible, but it's, it's, it's equivalent to church history, first century. All kinds of folks got saved in the Colosseum watching that. They had a revival just about break out. And the emperor, his name was Domitian, he said, get this cockroach out of here. They couldn't kill him. Why? Because God wasn't done with him yet. And they sent him to the island of Patmos, which you all know about, right? Now, when he gets to the island of Patmos, a wild thing happens to him. When I was a little boy growing up in, New in Yorkville in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, I remembered my parents would take me down to, uh, down to uh, uh, the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. I guess down near Madison Square Garden somewhere, I think. Probably the old Madison Square Garden. Anybody remember those days? Raise your hand. 
Okay, yeah. And we went to, and one of the things I remembered seeing there was a dude shot out of a cannon. That's before Evil Knievel ever had his first diaper change. And he, how, how many ever saw some guy get blown out of a cannon? Wasn't that crazy looking at that? Boom! Into that big old net? Yeah. You know, that's what happened to John. He wakes up one morning on the island of Patmos, and later that day, at some moment, he's blown in a cannon. He's blown like this, look. <laughs> What's he say over there in verse 8, I think, of chapter 1? I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. You ever read that verse? And you all know we call Sunday the Lord's day in a devotional kind of an application. But in the Word of God, doctrinally, anytime you read that phrase, the day of the Lord or the Lord's day, it's talking about the tribulation period, Armageddon, all that period of time collectively in some sense. Everybody has different opinion where you start it and end it. But it's that bad end of the time. That's the day of the Lord, boy. You understand? That's over here. John got fired all the way out into the future to write that book of Revelation for you. Now, preacher, I mean, Christians, I was only, listen, I was only saved about three months. I got saved in 1974, August, week after I got, day after I got back from my honeymoon in Hawaii with my new Southern Baptist wife, took her, went to the church that I'd been listening to over the radio, preacher on the radio. I'm listening to it driving to the airport every morning where I work. And I visited once, got scared to death and came back the second time and got saved. And I was, and I was called to preach three months later. And then and after that, I, I, I started going to a Bible institute there in Media, Pennsylvania, Calvary Bible Institute. You know how dumb I am? The first, I took three classes, preacher, uh, systematic theology and something else, and then the book of Revelation. And I'm just the only saved three months, say amen right there. And the first thing they handed me, they handed me a commentary by Harry Ironside. And if you all remember that old commentary at the back, you pull the chart out. And had the bugles and the monsters and all. I thought, what? That, that scared me to death looking at that thing. And I remember, preacher, the first thing I read, because they cover, you know, after chapter one, then you got chapter two and three. And before you get to the heavy, crazy, wild stuff in chapter four on, they cover in chapter two and three. Remember that? You know, it's the, you, know, you know what I learned? I was only saved six months and I learned this. I know preachers all across America that haven't got a clue about what I'm talking to you about right now. All they know is that can't be right. That's Ruckmanism. That's heresy. I read it in Harry Ironside's commentary 40 years ago. It's sitting in your Schofield Bible notes now over a century old. Back to the same thing about you know, Ezra Stiles' 1739 chapel sermon in Yale talking about the enlargement of Japheth. Most Christians today, and especially preachers, are so politically correct and scared of their own shadows, it's unbelievable. This is what people have believed forever. And what Oliver Green said in his commentary as well, uh, Harry Ironside, I'm reading it, I'm only saved six months. And what it's saying is something very simple. When you read those seven churches in Asia Minor, in chapter, the, the letters to the seven churches, right? In chapters two and three, what, what they'll tell you is those letters were written to, John wrote to, seven, uh, wrote to seven real churches about seven real sets of problems. But how many of you, how many of you believe God can uh, think and chew gum at the same time? Yeah. I bet your quarter he can multitask. <coughs> and boy, that book of Revelation is wild stuff. You read there in chapter two and three, you got, you got seven real churches in real time during the church age that had several sets of problems and you can use any of that material in your churches today to all kind of benefit for sure. But some of the doctrine in there ain't going to fit no church age application if you look at it. It's going to spook you out. That's doctrine for the tribulation period. But on top of that, because God can do at least three things at once, you know what the Lord did? He also gave those three, those, those two chapters a complete prophetic profile layout. Look, look here. Look at us. We're saved. When did you and I get saved? Look. Look when we got saved. Am I right? Yep. This is when we got saved. Hey, man, brother, I want to read that book of Revelation to find out what's coming down the road. And what's coming down the road for us? What do they always say? What's next? the next step on God's prophetic calendar or, or clock, right? Hey, it's the rapture, amen, right? 
That's what we're looking for. And then that, that's in Revelation 4, 1. I, I heard a voice saying, come up hither and bang, I'm in heaven, right? Yeah, amen. And chapter 5 and 6 and 7 and all those chapters are going to tell you what happens while we're up partying up there with the Lord. Amen. Well, that's okay for us. Bible tells you in the last days, men are going to be lovers of their own selves. We're so preoccupied with ourself in the last days, we don't think of hardly anybody but us. Let me, let, me, let me ask you a question. What about the Christians over here? Apostle John had two, two stellar converts. You've heard of them in church history. Polycarp and Ignatius. Two, two good men he led to the Lord became preachers. What about them and all their converts? Anything in front of them? This 2,000 this, this more years in front of them that, than was in front of us. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is this. Those two chapters, two and three, with those seven churches, that lays out the whole church age in a consecutive order. And I was only saved three months when I learned this, I so. saw. Can I ask you a question? Look what happened to John. One moment he's over here in 90 AD, and then pow, the guy in the cannon uh, in, in the circus. Look, see, look where he's going. Look where he's going. Brother Dan, he's going right through the church age. And guess what he's doing as he's going through? <laughs> you know, back in here, with only a supernatural way God could do that. He's seeing the whole church age as he goes by. Brother, bro, uh, brother, uh, brother Dunbar says, I turned. And when I turned, I saw the seven, I saw Jesus holding those seven chur churches in his hands. Tur it's behind him when he gets over there, backwards. He looked at the whole thing. Say, Brother Grady, this is getting heavy. Yeah, I know. The Bible talks about the meat of the word. You ever read that? Mm -hmm. Some things are heavier than others. I preach in San Antonio, uh, Amarillo, Texas about every year in a church, Charity Baptist Church out there. They got a restaurant called the Big Texan. That's, that, that's the craziest steakhouse, the biggest steakhouse in the whole country, most popular. That's where they give you that 72-ounce steak. If you can eat it, it's free, Amen. There's a lady about the size of this sweet little widow lady here who holds the record. She ate two of them oh, in one night. Um, go, go look it up. You think I'm kidding you? <laughs> and if, listen, neighbor, if you start that deal and you don't finish it, you got to pay for it. What's it cost? A dollar an ounce plus tip. <laughs> hey, this is the meat of the word, what I'm giving you tonight. This is a 72-ounce steak we're talking about tonight. Now, in other words, look, in case you haven't got it yet, it's very simple. When he writes the first letter to the church at Ephesus, real church, real problems. But that's going to represent the, the period from the, from the beginning of the church up to probably about uh, the time of Paul's death, about the first 30 years, that period, okay? When you get to the next letter that he writes, that's the letter to Smyrna. That starts at the death of Paul, and that runs up to about 325 A.D., when Constantine shows up, every one of those seven churches builds on the next one, and it's showing you what's going to happen in the church age. It doesn't mean anything to us, per se, because it's behind us. But all these folks are coming through history, and they've got something laid out right in front of them that's going to show them what's in front of their world. I think Revelation's a futuristic book, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's not just futuristic for us, it's for all these people. Okay, now watch. We're not going to go into detail with all the, the seven churches. I'm really just going to highlight a few of them, but concentrate just on one. So, the, now, now again, again, do you know Revelation is the only book in the whole Bible that promises you a blessing every time you read it? Or hear it taught? I'm sure you've heard that before. I'm sure your pastor's taught you Revelation. You don't go three verses into that book till you get that promise. You ever get the press? Open up Revelation and you'll get a blessing. So, so for instance, the, so I'm trying to build on all this so you'll, you'll get some perspective. Do you know what's the main thing I remember from Harry Ironside's commentary 46 years ago when I first read it? You know what's the main thing I read? Thank you, Jesus. All right, he's, he's here tonight. Amen, Brother Grady. The main thing that I remember reading was Ironside said, the key to those seven churches representing seven consecutive periods. You ever hear people talk about the Laodicean church age? Mm -hmm. That's the last letter. 
Okay? That's where we are now, see? But it starts back here in the Ephesus era. You know what Oliver Green said? This, I mean, they both said the same thing. Oliver Green and Ironside, listen. And Larkin taught this, and, and, and Dr. Ruckman, oh, Schofield notes, ready? He said, the key to the whole study is each of the seven names of the churches. The names set the, set the tone, and the press, Laodicea means rights of the people. Right. That sound like the people were like today? My rights, my world. Each name, that salad just got me. I think it's the, what are them crazy? I was trying to tell my wife what your wife made for those, uh, I said brown little things with a lot of crumbs. What were those things she made for dessert? Oh, no big cookies. Oh, they changed my life. I ate too many of them. <laughs> I ate too many of them. I really did. Um, the names are the key. Kabish? All right, now watch. It makes it's the most exciting. Mean, I was blown out of my socks when I first learned this. It was one of the most exciting things I've ever read. I got a book back there given by inspiration. You should get that. 300, it's my most popular book. It's the smallest book I've written. That's why people like it. 300 pages. I deal with all of this right in the beginning. You know what the, you know what the second chapter, the, the title of the second chapter is? I shot that guy across with a cannon. You know what the chapter is called? Forward to the past. Anybody remember Back to the Future? But John was forward, right? To the past, okay? All right, now watch. The first letter unto the angel of the church in Ephesus. Or maybe you want to have your Bible open now because we're not going to cover it verse by verse, but I'll show you a couple of these highlights and you're going to get excited because you have no idea what this has to do with where we're going. And I'm not going to waste your time then I with something boring, okay? All right, what does Ephesus mean? The word, right? It's a city in Asia Minor, right? It means desirable one. Desirable, that's what it means. Hey, you know what that is? That's the first generation of the New Testament church, boy. Unto the angel of the church in Ephesus. Write these things. I, I, and and, uh, and uh, he says all kind of positive things about that church, don't he? Brother Dan, what's that first verse say in chapter 2? Read verse 1 and 2 out loud. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he, that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. You cannot bear them which are evil. That's the first, first generation of Christians, boy. They were tough, separated, dedicated, hard working, right? But guess what they did? After a generation, they kind of got lukewarm, a little warm, cooled down a little bit, and then the Lord got mad, in a, as a father would. And right down there toward the end, Dan, doesn't it say something about, you've left your what? You left your first love. You see that? I mean, he tells them to repent, straighten up your act. That's the first generation, okay? All right, now watch. That starts around, you know, 33 AD, whenever the, the church is getting underway. Look, and I'm going to say it runs up to about the end of the Apostle Paul's life. Now, let me tell you something. Somewhere around here, I forget exactly what year it was. Okay, no, no. no let, let's, let's stop right there. Okay. Now, now, when you get to the, the next church is the church at Smyrna. I think somebody's moving to Tennessee. Is that right? Because you, you're going to be near Smyrna, Smyrna New, uh, Tennessee. Is that right? Who's that guy? All right, if I were you, I'd go east a little more, young man. <laughs> go east, young man. <laughs> I mean, they, they, Tennessee's got three parts. Elvis... Willie and Dolly. That's how everybody describes it. Elvis Presley, you don't want to go there. That's a bad place in Memphis. And then Nashville's right in the middle. That's Willie Nelson. Amen. He's from Texas. You want to go to Dolly. Amen. Dollywood on East Tennessee. But, any, but anything in Tennessee beats New York. You get escape from here. You're better off going to purgatory than living in New York. Amen. I'm telling you, neighbor. Okay. So Smyrna is the next church age unto the angel of the church in Smyrna. Brother Dan, maybe you could help me there. Keep your Bible open. I may, you can be the black Bible reader tonight, and I'm the black preacher, okay? That other guy did a good job last night, didn't he? The funniest part was his wife was doing that to him. You go up there. You're the, you're the man. You're the man. <laughs> okay, now, now you know, uh, you remember the sermon on Sunday morning? Mary broke that alabaster box open, poured out that ointment. You know what myrrh is? You see that word myrrh in Smyrna? Smyrna? That's an embalming element. 
That's, that's for dead bodies. When you start this next letter, it's all bad. It's all bad. You read that letter, look at the letter. It's all bad. Um, be, be, faith, be thou faithful unto death. Is that what it says? And I'll give thee a crown of life. Thou shalt have tribulation one. Ten days. You all see that? I, I, know, you're, you're, I know you're poverty, but, but, you're, but you're rich. You see all that stuff? What's that talking about? Watch. This is so cool. Any, if I, if anybody can get this. Look. This period is going to start about right here when Paul gets his head whacked off with Nero. Right after that, the Apostle Peter is going to be martyred. Church tradition says he was crucified upside down. You've heard about all that stuff. And Nero starts burning Christians alive uh, at nighttime in his ch for his chariot races. We go to ball stadiums at night, turn the lights on. They had Christians burning all over the place for light. Sick stuff, neighbor. All that terrible stuff you've never hearing about, Christians thrown to the lions. All of that begins right around with Nero. Because the, the Roman Empire thought that the Christians were a part of Judaism. Because they kind of looked like they were together. And the Jews had like a special dispensation. The government didn't want to mess with them. They kind of let them alone. But when they started seeing the Jews persecuting the Christians, like Stone and Stephen, they said, hey, these dudes are something else. They're not Jews. And that's how they started to come out, come after the Christians, right? Okay, now that, that is going to run from 65 AD or about 60 AD when, when the persecution begins up to about here, look, in 325 roughly when the persecution ends. Again, this, this is not difficult if you want to learn something. Some of you probably know this already. Thou shalt have tribulation Ten days. You see that verse somewhere in the Smyrna letter? You know Coinky Dinky? Somebody said a coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. You know that just happens to be ten Roman persecutions? Two of them empire-wide, eight of them local, localized area persecutions. Hey, neighbor, guess what happened about right over here? I told you John had two famous converts. We've heard of them. Polycarp and Ignatius. You know what happened to Polycarp? Burned him alive. 86 years old. They tried to get him to recant at the last minute. At the stake. You know what he said? He said, 80 and 6 years have I served him, and he hath done me no wrong. How then can I do this great disservice against my king? They burned him after he finished that sentence. You know what happened to Ignatius? John's other convert? They took him in a wagon. He was, a, he was the pastor, I think, at Smyrna. I think. And they took him in a wagon to Rome, took him in the Colosseum, threw him to the lions to be eaten alive. You know what his last words were? He wrote a letter to some Christians as he's moving forward in a wagon, you know, stop for, get some water. And he sent a letter out. All the Christians are coming to the, crying out. He's heading to his martyrdom. You know what his last words in his last letter said? If the lions don't charge me, I'll charge them. I want to be ground to powder in the mouths of the lions so I'll be here no more in this world. Ready? Don't, don't pass out when you hear the next thing I'm going to say. Ready? Fast forward 2,000 years. But if I open my church, I'll get a fine <laughs> for COVID. <laughs> these martyrs have been rolling over in their graves looking at these excuses for churches and preachers in our time. Lots of good churches shut up a little bit in the beginning. They didn't know what was going on. I'm talking about the preachers that are still hiding under their beds today. Hey, crazy things. I saw a cartoon. A guy said, I, in an internet service, said, I went forward, got on a conviction and went forward, but my head hit the TV screen. Amen. <laughs> saw another one with a guy talking to his preacher on the phone. Hey, preacher, I'm sorry. I couldn't make it in this morning, but I caught, it, I caught the service on the phone. Amen. Look. Phone in his hand. Other hand, he's fly fishing. <laughs> These dumb churches wreck their wreck their works. Oh, oh, oh! I almost forgot something. Almost forgot something. Anybody remember, remember that prayer back here in sixty-five A.D. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, 
for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life with all godliness. Anybody remember that? Hey, look. Anybody see it yet? Man, we're going almost 300 years already. I guess God must be sleeping or something. Now, I said that Smyrna period ends right here with the next period beginning, the name of Pergamos. Why does this period end here? Because this is when the persecution ends. Why? The devil said, if I can't destroy the church from the outside with all this persecution, I'll destroy it from the inside. Paul said, I know that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. And also from among your own selves shall enemies or uh, uh, wolves arise, enemies arise, and, not, and so forth. Now, now here's, here, so what, what are you talking about? Well, here's where the devil pulled a big con job on the church. It's easy to remember because the guy he used, his name was Con. Constantine. The first so-called saved emperor. Claimed he got every Bible college in America. I taught church history for 10 years in Bible college. Matter of fact, preacher, 10 years I taught a, a, a three-hour class on church history. That means they met three hours a, a week, you know, for 16 weeks. I taught 2,000 years of church history. Guess what textbook I used? Take a wild guess. You got it on your lap. All I used was chapter 2 and 3 for 16 weeks. That's how much stuff's in there. Go get the book and you'll see. I'm just touching the surface here. And, uh, and uh, um, so Khan, Constant Emperor Constantine was a pagan, but he claimed he, on, a, on, a, on the eve of a big battle, I'm skipping 90% of it for time, he claimed he saw a vision in the sky with a big cross in this sign conquer. And he had his men put, all the, on, uh, put crosses on all their shields, you know, and then they won this battle the next day and he became a Christian. And he was so phony, it wasn't even funny. I, 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 I could spend three days talking about all the wicked, crazy, perverted things. He was basically a Jehovah's Witness. And, uh, and there's no time to go into it all, but he wasn't any more saved than Mickey Mouse was. But anyway, here's what he did. Look, remember the names of the churches. They're going to tell, us, tell you something. I didn't tell you what Pergamos means yet. You know how the devil calmed the church? He used con the, the devil used Constantine to calm the church. And this is what he said. Hey, you guys, I'm saved now like you. Look. Tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to lift you up out of the catacombs and restore you back to your freedom. I'm going to build your churches. We've been wiping you out for 200 years. We're going to fix everything now and, and we're going to make Christianity the legal religion of the Roman Empire. And get this, now we're going to outlaw the pagans like we used to outlaw you. What do you think about that? Well, these, most of these Christians were so banged up and beat up. That sounded pretty good to me. Yeah, let's get them pagans for a change. Amen. Of course, there's always a hook in there, always a catch. Guess what the catch was? Now, the only thing is, you got to kind of let me be in charge of the church. What do you think? Look at these nice buildings I'm going to build you. You're going to have to marry me. I'll be your groom. I mean, Jesus is okay, too. Mm -hmm. You know what the word Pergamos just happens to mean by quinky dinky? Ready? It's a compound word. It means marriage and elevation. I'm going to elevate you back up out of your catacombs where you've been hiding for years and marry you to me. I'll be your groom. And listen, you always hear about church state stuff. We're not Protestants, we're Baptists. We don't believe in a church state. We believe in separation, right? Exactly. It started right here. This is where the state and the church got married. From that point on in the Roman Empire, if you're a Roman citizen, you're in the, Christian, the Catholic Church is what it's going to develop into. And there's no, there's no freedom to do anything else. This is the way it is. You understand, neighbor? You've got to learn something. This is what God wants you to be. He, doesn't want, he wants you to be wise as serpents. Okay. Now, so that runs from 325, right, till about 500 A.D. Now watch this. Between 325, when Constantine becomes the, the big enchilada, to about this, some of these numbers are meant just to be easy to remember, round numbers, you know, they're not exact. But about here, there's a, there's a change that takes place, and I'm going to show you, which introduces the fourth church. Right here, though, watch, between 325, watch, and 500, something very important happens in church history. Around 476, the Roman Empire collapses. Did you hear the expression, Rome wasn't built in a day? Well, it didn't collapse in a day, but by that's, 
That's the last year that an emperor sat on the, ro the throne in Rome. What Constantine, you ever, you ever hear the expression, you see the handwriting on the wall? By 325, when Constantine was in there, he starts seeing those barbarians coming close to the empire. The, the Roman Empire was getting soft. Divorce was, was skyrocketing. Morals were, fell apart. Everybody wants to go to the Colosseum and watch this, go to the circus. Everybody's playing games. Look. And the, the, the empire is going down morally. Go get Gibbon's famous book, The Rise and the Fall of the Roman Empire. And so they're, they're, they didn't have any kind of a standing army very much anymore. The, the empire is going downhill. So guess what they had to do? They had to buy, buy, hire the barbarians to be mercenaries for them. And they got to keep hiring more each year. And after a while, those mercenaries, you know, these German barbarian tribes, they're pretty dumb. But after a while, they said, hey, wait a minute. If we're so tough and they're so dumb and weak and, we, and they got to pay us to fight for them, well, why don't we just fight them? <laughs> Take over the joint. And, you know, they weren't all there upstairs. It took a while to figure that out. Now, Constantine can see that's starting to happen, right? So he sees the handwriting on the wall that we ain't got much time left. So guess what he does? He opens up another capital for the Roman Empire, all the way over in Turkey, in Nicaea, Istanbul area, and that, became, that would become what you've heard in history, the, Byzan the Byzantium Empire. It's the Roman Empire on the east. Anybody remember? Anybody remember the message the other day about the, the gold head, silver arms, brass belly, and what? Iron legs. How many legs? Two, one for, four, one for Rome and one for Istanbul. Constantinople is really where it was. You all see that? So he, he gets out of town quick, you know, and he's over there in Constantinople now, and then he dies, and the next dude, I mean, and the guy that takes his plate away, they put a, they put a co-emperor in Rome, right? But that place is going down, he's over there, Constantine's over there, and his flunky co-emperor's over here, and, and whoever, I can't remember his name, and he gets replaced by somebody else. But by 476, the barbarians crash in. Cicero wrote the book, Enemy at the Gates, right? And that's the last time an emperor sat on the throne in Rome, over in, in uh, Rome. Now here's, very, now watch, that, that's about right here in 476, okay, see it? Look, uh, here's the marker here for the next age. 500. This is going to start the Roman Catholic system. It develops. It's evolutionary. It didn't happen overnight. You know where you got your greatest verse for this? In 2 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Then they give you two things to look for. Forbidding to marry and abstaining from meats. You know, when I grew up in the Catholic Church, Fridays I couldn't eat any meat. Why? The guy with a dress on, tell, calling himself a mother, a father dressing like a mother, told me who couldn't get married, who's chasing little boys because he can't have a wife. He told me I couldn't eat meat on Fridays. That's latter times. That's a, that's a prophecy of the development of Rome, see? Didn't happen overnight. 500 A.D. is a good time that they usually start showing it. That's the first, one of the first real strong popes around this time. A guy named Leo, a little bit before 500, but 500 is a pretty good mark here. Now watch. I, I mean, this is stuff I never was taught in Bible college. When I went to Bible college as a student, I just cashed checks all the time. I didn't learn hardly anything. So it's important for me that God's people, this is not a normal service. You're not going to have another one like this again. Listen, if I didn't love you, if I didn't love you, I'd give you tonight and any night this week a sermonette for the Christianettes who smoke the cigarettes by the TV sets. Wouldn't you do that if you had to speak 38 times in 28 days? Wouldn't that what you'd do, save your voice? I'm trying to show you some love from God as one of the servants tonight to try to help you learn something. It's important for me that you'd get this. Now, I'm trying to teach you stuff no one, hardly anybody ever knows. Where'd the Catholic Church come from? I don't know. They're probably all around this neighborhood, aren't they? Yeah. Want to know where they came from? When the Pope left town, I mean, when the Emperor left town, remember? I mean, he goes there and this weak old guy over here finally gets overthrown and the Roman Empire ends, right? And there's no more Emperor. You know what happened when that happened? There was a vacuum of leadership. And the people said, what do we do now? We're in such bad shape, preacher, in Laodicean age. We've got to use stupid movies from television. 
to help people see truth. Anybody ever seen a dumb movie, Forrest Gump? My man's running for two years. Remember, he's crazy. He got a beard and a hat by the end of two years. He's just jogging for two years or something crazy like that, right? And by that time, he's like a cult leader. And he's got all these other nutty people running behind him. It's a crazy scene at toward the end of the movie. And then all of a sudden, he stops. That's it. I'm going home. He walks away. He's been in the newspapers. He's a phenomenon in America. Do you remember what happens if you saw it? All the people that were following him, they said, well, wait a minute, what are we going to do now? That's the greatest picture of where the Catholic Church came from. When the, when the emperor was gone, the Europeans didn't know what to do. They had to have a leader. Take a wild guess who stepped in the shoes of the emperor. The preacher, pastor back then, called bishops, the bishop of the church at Rome. Every city had a Christian pastor in it. And just like politics, the bigger the city, the more important the preacher was who had the church in that city. And all of this is all going downhill. Corruption. As the decades are going by, right? Oh, did I tell you this? Did I tell you this? Back here at Pergamos, right? The marriage and elevation with Constantine. What do you think of that deal? I'll take care of you. Just let me marry you, right? You understand? The majority of the Christians said, yeah, that's cool. We like it. But a remnant said, forget you, and said, no way, Jose, and kind of went underground. You understand that? And by about here in 500 AD, or four, when the emperor's gone, that remnant's still running underground, and the, and the so-called Christians on the surface, they want some leadership, and that preacher that's in Rome, the bishop at Rome, he steps up, and he starts to get more and more influence, because there's no more emperor there, see? He filled the vacuum. I'm trying to show you how the Catholic Church developed. And by 500 A.D., guess what that dude was called? He's called the Pope, which means Papa. You can always spot him because he's got a half a grapefruit on his head. Say amen right there. Okay. Now, so that starts the Catholic system in around 500 A.D. with the next letter. Now, you're not going to believe this. Look at, look at the fourth letter. This is the one I want to really show you something cool. and You're not going to believe where we're going. Now unto the angel of the church in Thyatira. You all see that? Is that about verse 18, I think? Yeah. Okay, see that? You ain't never going to believe what that word means. You're never going to believe in a million years. If you had to pick one word that would describe the Catholic church and all its doctrines, evil doctrines and heresies and all its corruption, right? You couldn't get a better word than Thyatira. Remember, it's a real city in Asia Minor, where there was a New Testament church, and John's writing to it from Patmos, right? But representative of this prophetic, beautiful progression of events, it represents the, the beginning of the Catholic system. Guess what Thyatira just happens to mean? Are you ready, neighbor? Couldn't make this up if you had to. It just happens to mean continual sacrifice. That's what the word means. Can I get a witness on that one? Hey, I don't know how old these little kids are. When I was about eight years old, maybe seven years old, I don't remember. I was about second grade, I guess. I still have my picture when this happened. I took my first Holy Communion in St. Stephen's of Hungary Catholic Church in New York City. Anybody remember Don Amici? He was a member of our church. Yeah, when the altar boy didn't show up for Mass, Don Amici would get up and go back there, take a suit off, put his little dress on, he'd come out to be the altar boy. Amen, right there. You know what I used to do as an altar boy? I'd come out with my little dress on, with my little, little, I don't know what you call it, it looks like a, fry, a mirror or a frying pan, handle with a round thing on it. You, you've seen that. And, did I ask you how many ex-fish eaters there were? You didn't have many in there. What do you do, racist? You don't like ex-Catholics? Are you scared of the thunder? You're all getting quiet. I'm only giving you the heaviest material you're ever going to hear in your life. You don't know where we're going in just a few minutes. Watch. I'm a Catholic altar boy, little kid in Catholic New York. And the, the people lining up to get the, you've all seen that, right? They're lining up to get communion. Today, they hand you the host and you put it on your own tongue. In the old days, you want to know what's wrong with all these crazy people in your town? You can't get them to move out of the Catholic Church. They're, they're locked in. Fifty years in the Church of Rome, Charles Chenequay, a Roman Catholic priest from Canada, got saved in St. Anne's, Illinois, and, and he joined the Presbyterian Church, and he wrote a book one day called Fifty Years in the Church of Rome. 
He was a priest for 50 years. Most of you have heard that book. You know what he said in there? He said when a little kid takes his first Holy Communion for the first time in a Catholic church, he defiles his conscience and burns himself out because he knows it's a piece of bread. But he makes himself believe it's Jesus' body because that's what they told him. You got to believe that. And he's burned out forever. And Ch Chinook, we use the illustration that the moment a kid does that, he gets a chain put around his neck. And that chain stretches all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. And at the other end of the chain is El Papa, the Pope, sitting on his throne. He's got that kid forever. That's why you knock on the doors of these Catholics and they say, I'm a Catholic. You ever hear it? Chicago, they're Catholics. LIC, they don't say Catholic. I'm Catholic. And the dude hadn't been in taking Catholic Church in 50 years. You know how it is, but that's just what they are because they got burned into their brain as a little child. I used to have the altar boy, look, I'd be serving Mass. You, you, here's the priest moving down. All the people are kneeling down in front of the rail to get, they're going to eat Jesus. That's what they're doing. He's, that's, they're eating Jesus' body, look. And I, I'm coming with a little plate and I have to keep it under their chin. Just like here, like here and like here. When he puts it on the tongue, puts it on their tongue, and then he puts it on. So what are you doing that for? In case Jesus falls off the tongue, I got to catch him in a net. Yep, that's true. You're all looking at me like a calf looking at a new gate. <laughs> you need to do some research. You've missed a lot, neighbor. I'm six years, seven years old, getting ready to go up to take the Lord's Supper. You, we call it the Lord's Supper. We're so spoiled. But this is how all your Catholic neighbors in this town grew up. I'm kneeling there waiting on my first Holy Communion, eight years old, like these little kids here, look. And I'm nervous as a cat, preacher. You know what I did? Kneeling there, I took that finger right there, look. And I started to outline furniture on my shirt. I made a chair. I made a bed. I made a little dresser over here. What are you, crazy? No, I'm getting ready to swallow Jesus. He's going to be living in there. I give him some furniture. <laughs> Your little kids are singing, Jesus loves me and learning the Bible. I'm, bu I'm building furniture on my chest for Jesus. Yeah. Boy, if you grew up in a Baptist church, you better be shouting through the rooftop yeah, how good God's been to you. Yeah, so you know what that means? Thyatira means continual sacrifice. So guess what they're doing every single Sunday in every crazy Catholic church in this town? They're sacrificing Jesus all over again in the Mass. That's why they have an altar up there. You got an altar you kneel at. They got an altar up there where they perform a sacrifice every Sunday. They turn a piece of bread into Jesus' body and crucify him again. Contrary to what Hebrews says about five times, he died once for our sin, not over and over again. You all know that. But that's where the heresy starts about 500 A.D. You all see that? Now this gets really wild, neighbor. Now I want to show you the main thing about the night. Got your Bible open there to that fourth letter? Oh, this gets wild. Trust me, neighbor. If you don't like this message, you don't have to come tomorrow night. Just leave your love offering tonight. For tomorrow night. Revelation. Revelation chapter number 2. Verse 18. This is the Lord now. You're going to see something that's going to make the hair stand up on your neck. I haven't said anything since I've started on Sunday yet that I didn't do. That I didn't do, you know, as God's helping me, right? So I'm going to sh you're going to see something that's going to make your hair stand on your neck. Is that all right? Watch. This is the Holy Spirit now speaking to the Catholic Church age as well as that local real church. But prophetically now he's speaking to the Catholic system. Watch. Verse 18. And under the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith, look, the Son of God, not Mary. Every Catholic's taught to worship Mary over Jesus. It's not Mary. It's the Son of God. And he's not in a real good mood either, look. Who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. Brass always a type of judgment in the Bible. Now, before he starts cleaning the clock, their clock, He's going to say one positive thing about them. In the Middle Ages, neighbor, if there were any hospitals, they were run by Catholic nuns. If there were any orphanages run by the Catholic Church, any asylums run by Catholics, they had something in the Middle Age called the corporal works of mercy, ministering to people that are hurting, you know, orphans and stuff. 
uh, the Catholic system was the only thing that did any of that. They had something called, listen, listen, they had something called just, J-U-S-T, just war theory. No fighting on Sundays, no killing uh, civilians or torturing civilians, no fighting on Easter or Christmas. Catholic Church made all these weird rules, right? Called just war theory. Hey, hello, anybody ever heard of the Geneva Convention in World War II? It's a leftover of that principle, yes? The man back there, right here, the, that invented the neutron bomb. There he is right there, me and him, in his backyard. I told you about him the other day, Sam Cohen. You know what he said in his memoirs? He said he created the neutron bomb according to the theories. He's a Jew, according to the theories of just war theory of, of the Middle Ages. What does that mean? Minimal suffering. You throw a neutron bomb into a neighborhood in Fallujah with 300 raghead soldiers in there, you don't have to chase your boys in there to get them out, lose your treasure. Throw a neutron bomb in there. In 30 minutes or 90 minutes or whatever it is, every one of those guys is dead as a hammer. Their organs burned out from the inside and there's not a broken window. Zero blast, zero blast and enhanced radiation. The neutrons go through the walls and kill people. He did that to minimize suffering based on just war theory. Now watch the Lord in, uh, say something positive to those people that were doing those very things in the Middle Ages. Watch this, but because it's only going to last one verse and then he's going to blast them. Watch. Verse 19. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the, in the first. You all see that? Look at the first word of verse 20 though. Having gotten that out of the way. What's the next word? Nevertheless. <laughs> I have somewhat against thee. Because thou, thou sufferest that woman. Jezebel. Remember this has something to do with the first century church in Thyatira. It was a real problem there. But because God can chew gum and think at the same time. It's also showing you a thousand year period of middle ages history. Jezebel, you allow that woman. Do you know the Catholic Church has always gone through a, by the, you talk about pronouns, gender pronouns, talked about that Sunday school? They've always gone by a female pronoun. How many ever heard the expressions? They're all over the place. Holy Mother Church. That's why the Pope wears a dress. All the Catholic priests call themselves fathers. Jack Hiles used to say, why they're dressing like mothers, amen. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Are you allow that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things, look, sacrificed unto idols. You know, what I, you know what word I have in my Bible right there? My own note? The wafer. The Eucharist. The Catholic host. Goes up a piece of bread, comes down as Jesus. And every, everybody's scared. I, I got to make sure he don't fall off the dude's tongue. Boy, if you never went, had any, know anything about this, you probably, it sounds like a fairy tale I'm telling you tonight. Verse 21, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, watch it, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. See that? Her and they that commit fornication, adultery with her. What's that? You go over there to chapter 17 and read about it. The great, the great whore, Mystery Babylon. She's, it says in, in verse 2 of that seven, chapter 17, she's in bed with the, with the kings of the earth. When did that start? Back at Pergamos. Church, state. The kings and the popes in bed together. And the inhabitants of the earth, the next verse in Revelation 17 says, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of their fornication. That's the children of the Pope and the kings mixed together. Look, the inhabitants of the earth are drunk, look, with the wine of their fornication. What's that all about? You know what it's all about? Well, uh, Brother Dan, you got, I don't know if you've still got your Bible open. Who's got, what's the next verse say? And I gave her a space to, uh, to repent, and she repented not, right? Behold, I will cast her, and then the commit adultery into a, into a uh, into fornication, into a bed, and then the commit adultery with her. And what's the next verse say? Kill her children with what? Anybody ever heard of the Black Death? Two-thirds of Europeans wiped out by God Almighty. I'm telling you, that Bible is more powerful than Facebook. I'm telling you that, neighbor. 
All right, now all that to say this. Remember I said I'd, I, I'd give you something to make the hair stand up on your neck? Eh, hey, maybe I just said that for fun, and I really don't have anything to show you, but maybe I do. Anybody want to see, see the hair stand up on your neck? Want to see something holy? Who's the Holy Spirit been talking to prophetically all this time? To the wicked Catholic system, yes? But you all know we had some ancestors of ours still alive serving God back then, yes? They've been here all along, haven't they? And right there when this church state junk started, they said, forget you. And they went underground and paid a price for it. They're still around. Would you like to see the Holy Spirit shift? He's been talking to the Catholic system all along. Now he's going to switch to our ancestors. What's the next verse say? Look at it. I'll quote it to you. But unto you I say. You all see that? And unto the rest in Thyatira as have what? Not this doctrine. Nor, nor what's it say? Nor speak to, what's the next thing to say? The, the of what? The of say it again. Yeah, you don't, you don't, you don't uh, drop to the depths of Satan as they speak. You all see that? Look at the days. Look what he's doing. He's, he, he's speaking to your ancestors right there in the dark ages. You all see that? Mm -hmm. Don't pass out now. Here comes your hair standing up on the back of your neck time. Ready? I will put upon you. Is that what it says? None other burden than that which you have already, right? What's the next two words? Hold fast. You know what you just read? You know what you just read? You just read what Christians have been doing ever since Paul had Timothy record that prayer. First of all, prayers, supplications, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may have a what? Quiet and peaceful life. You see anybody have that yet? Can I tell you what they've had all this time? You got a hymn in your hymn book. It'll tell you what they've had. You sing it every so often. Can I quote it to you? Look. Faith of our fathers living still in spite of, help me, dungeon, fire, and sword. That's all they've had so far. And so guess what that verse is. That, when that verse tells them, I'll give you nothing else to do but what you're already doing. Hold a revival campaign. <laughs> no, didn't, didn't, didn't tell them the whole revival. Didn't tell them to run bus routes. <laughs> told them to hold fast. You know how deep that is? Can you see how deep that is? Guess how those Christians in the dark ages had song services. He's bragging in a good way of how blessed you all are with music. Would you like that how the Christians sang in their services in the Middle Ages? Ask any missionary how they sing in China. Yep. Ready? Here's how they sing in their services. Ready? Amazing grace, how sweet does it. <laughs> Why did he do that? Because if they sang any louder, somebody might find out where they were. Want to see something deep? Get your phone later, or the computer later on your own, and just type in two words, Waldensian peddlers. You know, the Waldensians were the Christians in the Dark Ages, were in the, in the Alps. There's a very famous painting called the Waldensian peddlers. You want to see how they went soul winning in those days? They didn't do it like we do. Knocking on doors, hanging stuff. They didn't do that. Because it's off with your head. You know how they did it? Go look at the painting. There's two soul winners disguised as merchants. And they got a basket of fabrics. And they're going out trying to sell stuff. They're looking for people to witness to. And in this famous picture, you see a Waldensian missionary pulling out uh, uh, some scriptures out of the basket. 
And he's presenting it to a man and his wife. They look like a well-to-do nobleman type thing. And the woman's kind of like, just a little bit looking like she's interested. And the husband's checking her out real good. And those guys are literally taking their lives into the hand. And they're just estimating, I think we can get away with witnessing to them. You ever go on an airplane, sit next to somebody, you want to witness to them, but you got a four-hour flight, if you start talking to them right away you, and they don't want to hear it, you're going to blow the next four hours. Look, you ever been there? So you got to do tricky things like leave your Bible on the seat and go to the bathroom. Come back and see and if he's staring out the window for the rest of the flight. You know he's not interested. He sees that Bible there. Oh, are you a Christian? He'll bring it up to you. Now you know, go for it. Now I want to show you something. This is deep. This is so deep. This is as deep. As, forgive me, I'm writing a book. I have to stay psyched up. It took me 18,000 hours to write that book on Israel. Lost my health, heart attacks, blood sticking, high pr blood pressure, and type 2 diabetes. I was normal when I started that book. You, you do these things, you go about half loony. <laughs> a preacher said something funny today. I hope, I think it was a compliment. He said, you know, anybody that's ever been used to God's about half crazy. <laughs> I like that. I think I'm three quarters crazy. Amen. I really do. My little my mother taught me something before she died. She said, Billy, if anybody says you're crazy or you're crazy, just tell them I was born that way. What's your excuse, Amen? I mean, I've been half crazy. I'm a little kid, my favorite joke was two two crazy people in the mental institution. And one guy's shining a flashlight up in the ceiling. And the other guy's looking at him. He says, Hey, hey, bud, what you doing with that flashlight? Yeah, hey, shut up, leave me alone. And it keeps on shining the flashlight. And the guy bugged him again and said, man, what are you doing up there? He said, shut your mouth, I'll hit you with this flashlight. Pretty soon that guy couldn't take it anymore. He said, hey, look, if you don't tell me what you're doing, I'm going to take that flashlight away from you and beat you to death with it. So the other nut said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll bet you a quarter you can't climb up that beam of light. And the other guy said, what do you think, I'm nuts? Before I got halfway up there, you'd turn it off, amen? That's one of my favorite jokes. I was in grade school down here in Manhattan, 1958, when I heard that joke came in. <laughs> if anybody knows where I left off, I'd be appreciated if you'd tell me where it was. Those cookies are starting to get to me now, or whatever those things were. They were worth dying for. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I know what. Here's the deep thing. Go back to your prayer. You don't have to turn to it necessarily, but I'll quote it to you. Back in Timothy. Why did the Lord want the church to pray for a quiet and peaceful life? Take a wild guess. I don't know. Why did he say he was going to enlarge Japheth? What's Japheth mean? Beautiful. What's God want to do? Get the gospel to the world. Yes? Well, take a guess what the rest of that verse said back in Timothy. Ready? First of all, prayers, supplications, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for those that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. You know what the next verse says? For this is well-pleasing to God, who will have all men to be saved. You can get a lot more people saved when you've got a quiet sure and peaceable life to protect sure you. Can. Can I get a witness? Amen. You go look at the Apostle Paul with that crazy demon-possessed woman in Acts 16 chasing him around. These are the servants of the Most High God. Remember that crazy stuff? You know what the Bible says when he cast that devil out of that woman? Did you know what it says right before he cast the devil out? You'll get more insight than you can shake a stick at if you pay attention to the little details. Ready? It said, and Paul, being grieved, right, many days, Finally said, forget this. Boom, cast the devil out. Five minutes later, they're arrested. <laughs> Every day when Paul came out of his apartment house, he went like this, look. <laughs> hey, these are the servants of the Most High God. He's trying to dodge those crazy witch. Day after day. Because the moment the trouble hit the fan, no more soul winning. No more sneaking around trying to do what he was doing. You all see that? Okay, now watch. Have your people get up on my people, whoever that is. Okay, so here we are, neighbor, ready? Here's the Catholic system. Where's this run to? Oh, ooh, 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 ooh. 
Watch. This system runs up to about 1517. 1517 from, from, from 500 AD, that's when the Catholic system becomes strong, right? It runs about a thousand years. They didn't want the nail scarred foot. They, wanted the, they, they didn't want to kiss the nail scarred foot. They wanted to kiss a pope's toe, right? In the, in the Dark Ages. So the Lord gave them a satanic millennium called the Dark Ages, thousand years. About a thousand years later, it's going to get busted up with the Reformation. You know about that in history. But you want to see something spooky again? Something spooky again? Look at the end of the Thyatira letter. Look what the Lord says there. He's, he's talking about the ones that can overcome that period of time. Look what he says in verse 26 of chapter 2. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. See that? That's tribulation doctrine. You don't have to keep anything to be saved. You're saved now. Him will I give power unto the nations. And, he, and here's the millennial ruling, Christians ruling in, a, in the millennium. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. You know about that. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Look at verse 28. And I will give him what? Ain't that something, neighbor? Where are we heading for? We're heading for that King James Bible, right? Well, guess what happens? Before the sun comes up, what do you got? You got the dawn breaking. Is that right? Look at here. Here's where Martin Luther is going to break out here, and they're going to get the king, they're going to get the Bible starting with the Greek Texas Receptus with Erasmus, and it's going to go on over just a little further before it breaks out in 1611. You know what happens in 1388? Look. God said, I'll send you to what? The morning star if you hang in there during the Thyatira period. Is that what he said? You're reading it with your own eyeballs. Guess what pops up in 1388? Right before that period about ends, you got a guy in England named John Wycliffe who gives us the first Bible in the English language. No printing presses. Takes about 10 months to produce one handwritten copy. And if you wanted to rent one for an hour, it cost you an entire load of hay to have it for an hour. It's the Wycliffe English Bible. First Bible in English. What's that? Guess what his nickname just happens to be in church history. Just happens to be. Yeah. He's the morning star of the Reformation. That's what they call him. Just sitting in your verse. 1517. You got the next letter, Sardis, the fifth letter. And all that word Sardis means is bloody. Bloody one, remnant, and what you have is a war breaks out over here when a bunch of Catholics get saved at the Reformation with Martin Luther and these different men, John Calvin and Zwingli, these people you hear about, yes? And that starts a revolution going. Look, that's the Sardis period. Now watch this. That's real good, isn't it, Brother Grady? Well, the only problem is now there's two groups of people going to be killing your ancestors. Your Baptist ancestors. You know what I'm doing, preacher, last couple of days? Having to carry on a, a mild war on Facebook over our Baptist heritage. Got these guys starting to slip away from their Baptist positions and saying the Baptist is so worldly now, we're going to drop the name Baptist. All they are is a bunch of pragmatic Japheth pizza, they, and they don't want the, the reproach that goes with really being what a Baptist is all about. And they don't understand anything about their Baptist heritage. Listen. Now you're going to have the Catholics killing our Baptist ancestors. And then you're going to have the Protestants killing them now too. Why? Because the Protestants believe in the same thing the Catholics believe in. A church state. They're just saved people now that want to keep a church state. John Calvin in Switzerland cut a 15 year old girl's head off. Beheaded her. Because she slapped her mother in the argument. That's how they're running everything. Iron fist. Preacher, I'm over in Switzerland with my wife on a train going over a bridge by Lake Zurich, Switzerland. Beautiful swans on the lake. Pretty scene. I said, honey, that's very pretty looking out there. But in the 1560s, the Protestants used to take our Baptist ancestors out on barges, chained to each other, small little churches, 10, 20 people, chained together, chained to their pastor. And then they'd say this to them. You Baptists believe in immersion? We're going to immerse you permanently. Yep. And they boot them off the barges and drown them like rats. And they even had an expression for it. They called it the third baptism. Sprinkled as a Catholic or a Protestant baby. Immersed when you're dumb enough to listen to a Baptist preacher and get saved. And then third baptism is we'll take care of you. How are we doing? Ain't nobody got a quiet 
and peaceful life. You all see that? All right, watch. At the end of that Sardis period is the highlight. Look. Boom! The 1611 Bible comes out. Hallelujah over in England. Praise God, we've got the Bible finally. Yes, we've been looking for JPEG to be enlarged all that time. The 1611 comes out in 1611. Your King James Version. Yay! Hold on. Hold on. Look. Look. 1611. See it? Look. One year later. 1612. A Baptist preacher in merry old England. Edward Whiteman. Burned alive after King James signed the death warrant. Same king that gave you the Bible. Allowed to come out. Signed the death warrant for a Baptist preacher preaching out of that Bible. Preaching against baby sprinkling. Your ancestors had the right Bible finally. But they had no freedom to practice it. Well, I guess God had to do something about that. You know what happens about 25 years later? Look. You got a Baptist preacher in London who also happens to be a medical doctor named John Clark. And guess what he does? God sends him across the Atlantic Ocean to come to the New World. No freedom over here yet. But guess what he does? He founds the colony of Rhode Island. Nobody else was really there. He got, the, he got a charter from the King of England to let people do what in the world they wanted to do over here. To have freedom over here. And he founds the first Baptist church in America. In Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Later moves to Newport, Rhode Island, a few miles away. And why don't you go to Portsmouth, Rhode Island like I did and find the sign that's on the city limit put up by the Catholic city fathers. Rhode Island's the most Catholic state in America percentage. And look at the sign because it's, it gives them tourism money. I wonder what it means. Welcome to Portsmouth, established 1638, birthplace of American democracy. You think democracy is important? A democratic republic even voting? Freedom? You want to know where it started? It started in the Baptist colony, according to the Catholics. Because you can live in Rhode Island and believe anything you wanted and there's no persecution for religious views. Started by the Baptists. You want to know something else? The Jews found out about it. And they showed up there like crazy and they built a synagogue there. There's their synagogue right here. Look, that's a devil trying to distract you now. Everybody's phone can go off at the wrong time, but that's just the devil now. Don't worry about it. We're, we're about third base now, heading to home plate, and the best is coming. I'm just trying to show you what happened January 18th. Nothing exciting. And the world's coming to an end, by the way, on top of that. Nothing to get nervous about. Here's the synagogue that was built by the Jews in Newport, Rhode Island. It's Toro Synagogue. <laughs> I think some of you, I don't trust you. You're setting your phones to go off like, like you do when somebody's, like, the, like you go soul winning. And they, Yay, you're on, you're on it on the phone, John. You know, all that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> okay, the th I got the thunder going up here with God. I got you out there with the phones. I got my throat gear. I, I, go look at my s truck and see how many cups of tea bags I've got in there from keeping my throat lubricated. No joke. Look here. Here's the synagogue. It's the Toro Synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island. It's the oldest standing synagogue in America. Here's a picture on the inside of the synagogue. Here's the inside picture and there's a trap door they got right there because they used to run in for their lives. Now they're in America and they got a free place to go. And you know what neighbor? I took this picture with my own camera, Brother Dan. And if you look in the background, you see a big white steeple right there. You know what that white steeple is? That's that white steeple over here. That's John Clark, the Baptist preacher. That's the John Clark Memorial Church. That's the latest, last building they built in 18 something. It's still functioning as it's the oldest Baptist church in America and the oldest standing synagogue in America. Same picture with an American flag flying on their synagogue property. I don't know, I'll bless them to bless thee. I imagine America is going to start taking off. You talk about all those mansions, Pastor, around the, the lake area around here? Go check out the mansions in Newport, Rhode Island. It's got the highest concentration of millionaires anywhere in the New England area. I'll bless them that bless thee. But you know what happened to this guy? About 20 years later, look. About 20 years later, 
his assistant pastor went to Massachusetts to go to a, a blind man's house that used to go to their church in Rhode Island, but he's blind and he can't travel anymore. So he, they came over to preach in his house, give him a Sunday morning service, and right in the middle of the sermon, the doors were broken down. And, they, and they, they dragged them out, Pastor Clark and his assistant Obadiah Holmes, and they arrested them. About 20 minutes later, somebody paid the fine for Pastor Clark or so, and they let him out. He didn't even know what was going on. About that time, they raised some more money for the assistant pastor. But by now, the assistant pastor found out what had happened. He said, wait a minute, you can, I'm not going to let you pay my fine. I didn't do anything wrong. We were just preaching. And they drag him out and give him 40 lashes, or 39 lashes, at the whipping post in Massachusetts for preaching the gospel. They're only safe in Rhode Island. They're not safe in any place else. So you know what God says? I have to fix this problem. Look. And about 20, about 20 years later, about 20 years later, there's a man named Shubal Stearns who's a baby sprinkling congregational pastor in Connecticut. He's an unsaved dude. He comes out and hears George Whitfield preach and gets saved. His wife gets saved. His brother-in-law Daniel Marshall gets saved. You've heard a lot of this from Jeff Faggard, I believe. And then his brother-in-law's sister got, his wife got saved. Four of them got saved. And they went back to their little church in Connecticut and preached the gospel to everybody. Got them all saved. Then got to reading their Bibles and realized they need to get baptized. George Whitfield's preaching as a Protestant and evangelist. And he's, God's using him, the Baptists are being persecuted. And he gets loose preaching to everybody. And all these people are getting saved and they start reading their Bible. And they all start realize, realizing they need to get dunked. Like Clarence Larkin did. And they all start getting dunked and, George, and becoming Baptists. And George Whitfield scratches his head one day and says, All my chickens have turned into ducks. What's happening to all my converts? They're all becoming Baptists. God's getting ready to get this country going. And when that man gets saved and his whole congregation gets saved and they turn it into a Baptist church there in Connecticut, then God says, okay, it's time to go. And he moves them all down to North Carolina. 1755, they start a Baptist church in the middle of the wilderness, Liberty, South Carolina. And he starts the Sandy Creek Baptist Church with 14 people. There's only 47 Baptist churches in the whole country at that time. 40 of them are north of the Mason-Dixon line. Seven are down south. There's no there's persecution all over the place in the south. If you're in Virginia, you have a baby that's born and you're a Baptist. You don't get that baby sprinkled. They'll take your silver away. They'll take your cow away. They'll throw you in jail. And they start that church in 1755 and God blows the thing up. They're running 600 two years later. People say falling out of the trees. And those men start going out of that church and starting churches everywhere. And they go to Virginia and they start dozens of churches all over Virginia, Baptist churches. And the, and, the, and, the, and the government people go nuts. What's all this about? And they start locking those preachers up. I'm sure you've heard all this before. And on Sunday mornings, the, congrega the congregations are coming to their church services at the j local jail so the preacher can preach to them outside the wind through the bars of the jail. They're standing out in the courtyard and the preacher's locked up and preaching the sermons through the jail bars to the people out in the, in the courtyard. All over Virginia. Meantime, Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, all these key people you hear about, they're watching all this stuff. Matter of fact, half of them are lawyers defending these Baptist preachers. I could tell you a million stories, but I'm cutting out tons of stuff now for time. Well, guess what happens, neighbor? Watch. Here's what happens. <clears throat> the American Revolution breaks out. The Baptist people do their part. They were the most patriotic Americans, George Washington said. He had in his army uh, 103 chaplains in the American army. 34 were Baptists. They're about one-fourteenth of the religions in the, of America at that time, but they were one-third of the chaplains, patriots. I got whole chapters in my books written about this stuff. I can't explain it to you in a few minutes. Look, the war is over, and guess what happened? We won! But guess what? The persecution continues. And God says, I don't think so now. You owe these Baptist folks some, some, some mercy now. And so we started spinning our wheels after we won our, free, our revolution. Something called the Articles of Confederation, a government that didn't work. Too much states' rights, not enough federal government. God said, are you, are you tired of messing with these people? Because I'm not going to quit messing with you until you straighten up your act. Well, all of a sudden, a guy named James Madison writes a document called the United States Constitution, right? 
Now it has to be ratified or approved by nine of the 13 states. But everybody knows that Virginia is the key state. It's the biggest state, bigger than New York back then. If all 12 states said yes and Virginia said no, it would, the country would blow up. Every state had its own convention, right? They sent delegates to each, each capital of each state and those delegates would, f would fight it out and then take a final vote. This is basic American history that no kids are ever learning in school anymore. And to make a long story short, Virginia was the key, right? And the people in Virginia were going were to vote against the Constitution. That's where all the persecution was. And James Madison came to a... I'm, I'm cutting out a ton of stuff for time. James Madison comes to the number one Baptist preacher in Virginia, a man named John Leland, says, please, please support the Constitution, because he was voting against it. He said, if you, let's make a deal. He said, if you vote for the Constitution, I promise you I'll give you a Bill of Rights. And that preacher trusted him. And they shook hands, and they made a deal. And at the 11th hour, the Baptists switched their support and voted to endorse the Constitution. And it became the law of the land. Look. 1790. Don't get excited now. I've been waiting an hour to show you this. Do 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 do. Don't get excited. Nothing exciting coming up here. Uh, guess what happened in 1790? How are we doing? Come on First of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and for those that are in authority government that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty for this is well pleasing to God who will have all men to be saved you know through Japheth's preaching faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword. Hello. Nobody. I mean nobody. Got it. Until now. Do you know how deep this is? Do you have any idea how deep this is? Is there anybody in here that's got it? It took 17 centuries for that prayer to be answered. And we're the dipwads that got to appreciate and got the blessing of it. Yeah. And have you ever been in jail for preaching? Mm -mm. I can't, I don't see any hands. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. You say, preacher, it's over an hour. I know, but not only is the world coming to an end, but do you see what I'm telling you here? You're listening to a burdened preacher preach to you. You know what this is? Facebook is not real. That's real. You all see that flag? All it's made up of is stars and stripes. You ever heard that song? Stars and stripes forever from Mr. Souza? Do those stars make you think of some place you want to go when you die? You know, on that blue field? Of course, you can't get up there because of sin. Maybe the rest of the flag is going to take care of that. Those stripes. How many stripes? 13, the number for rebellion in the scripture? Wow. Is it 13 red stripes or 13 white stripes? No, it's seven red and six white. You know, seven is God's perfect number and six is the number of a man. Maybe we need a God-man who will take our stripes for us. And isn't it funny, it isn't seven white and six red, it's seven red and six white. Because you've got to go through the red to get into the white. And in it, one more coinky dinky. What's one more coinky dinky? 50 stars. Go to the last chapter of Leviticus and see if 50 isn't the number in the Bible. He's teaching numerology now. Brother Dan said 50 is the number for liberty. Every 50 years, Israel got its liberty. It's right. proclaimed. Uh, Netanyahu's got a liberty bell sitting on his desk in, 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 in Tel Aviv. He's, he went to high school in Philadelphia. They say he speaks English with a perfect Philadelphia accent. And isn't that something, brother? 
Ain't that something, brother? Guess what happens right here? The Philadelphia church age opens next, right here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't want to drive you crazy with too many coincidences to keep track of in one sermon, but take away, but just take one wild guess where the Bill of Rights was signed with a pen and a piece of paper. Guess where it was signed? Our first capital, a place called Philadelphia. And God opens up a door. And for the first time, what God wants for all men to be saved, now you can go for it and ain't nobody going to mess with you. Just keep on a-going. And everything that you've ever read about the Philadelphia age, all the great revivals, the great awakenings, all everything you've ever read happens about after this period of time here. Missions explodes. Why? Saved people finally have a place where nobody can touch them. These pious Christians making fun of us uh, with our Bill of Rights. Paul said, I appealed to Caesar. That was all he had to protect them. God gave us a piece of paper called the Bill of Rights. And the Christians are yawning their way through. I know you're not, but most are. Well, that runs. What does Philadelphia mean? Oh yeah, brotherly love. Isn't that why you're running your buses? Your visitation? Hang your door knockers? When you could be doing other stuff? Well, that runs up to the last letter, and I'm done with this. You got the letter of Laodicea. Uh-oh. Starts around the 1901. Because guess what happens? If you look at that Revelation letter to Philadelphia, thou hast a little strength and has, and has kept my word, it said. Hear it? Kept my word and not denied my name. What word do you think they, they're talking about? The word they got in 1611 but couldn't practice it. And God finally gives them a place to practice it. And so he tells the Philadelphia church, you've kept my word. And now I'll give you a chance to preach it. But by the time you, from 1790, by the time you get to 1901, they come out with a new Bible in New York, the New American Standard, the, 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 new, the, new, the, the American Standard Version, ASV. I guarantee you, I don't want to seem ugly, but go in the bathroom and see if it doesn't say American Standard on the toilet in that bathroom. I'm telling you, it just does. I'm telling you, neighbor. This was the word of God. That's just some junky counterfeit. And the whole 20th century is going to be one junk after another challenging that book. Until you finally get up to 19... 19 uh, oh, by the way, look at here. 1948, look what happens. Mm -hmm. you, had the, you had the Jews, look. You had the Jews over here in the Toro Synagogue right here. See? Coming into America for protect, protection. And now you're going to have... And now you can have the state of Israel, 1948. Come on, Jesus. Help me here now, Jesus. There you go. Thank you, Jesus. And here's the Jews. We'll put them on a porch. And now we got to watch out for Israel, too. Look. But it's not good, looking good, is it? 1962, we're going to throw the Bible out of the public schools. 1973, we're going to start butchering babies. How's it looking so far? Anybody home? Say, what's that all about, preacher? Well, you know what's funny? When it's a Philadelphia church age, what's the Lord say? I open a door for you. Look. And no man can shut it. Get on out there and I'll hold the door open and get the gospel out. When you get to the layout of seeing age, it's backwards. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's outside knocking, trying to get in. <laughs> if any man opens the door, I'll come in. They ought to see in church throwing the Lord out in the street. That's where we are tonight. And just a few nuts like you and me left. We're the remnant. Which brings us to the end of the sermon. What happens in 19, 2020? 1. January 18th. What happened? That constitution on paper. You know what happened January 18th? Look. It was nice while it lasted, 250 some odd years, I guess we had it. You know, the Baptist salute. Wasn't going to last too long. It was nice while it was here, wasn't it? You know where we are tonight? Right here. Right where everybody's been all along. There's no more real protection. You'll see. What's the verse? This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. They're here now. And it's only going to get wilder. 
So I'll close with this. Let me, let me give you something for your hair to stand up on the back of your neck one last time. When you get to the Revelation letter, if you look at it, we'll quit with this. Because I'll show you the very last marching orders God's going to give us. What did he tell the church in the dark ages? Just hold fast, hang on. But he gives us a Bible in 1611, doesn't he? And he said, you've kept my word. Now look at that last letter, Revelation 3, and we'll quit with this. By the way, you know what Laodicea means? You know what it means. It means rights of the people. And what did he say about the Laodicean church? You're rich and have need of not, uh, you have need of nothing. You're rich and increased with much goods. That's American Christians now. Nobody during this 2,000 years ever was tempted with money. Nobody. There was nothing to be tempted with. We get it in 20th century America, and 90% of the saved people say, I'm going to chase after the dollar, just like the lost people do. And then God says, you're lukewarm then. You're not even cold nor hot. You're worthless. I'll you know how bad it is? I married a nurse, and any nurse will tell you they use lukewarm water in a hospital to induce vomiting. God says, you make me sick to my stomach. I'll throw you up out of my own mouth. Go read it. I don't want to be ugly. I don't, but it's right in there. And look at here. What's he tell that church now at the end? Brother Dan, can you read me one last verse? And I'm done with this. My, I've been preaching this. Look, I've been preaching this so long. Look at my Bible. The pages are all torn up. I can't even see the pages anymore. Go look at that thing for me. And we'll quit with this verse. Look what it's... Now, when you get to verse 10, you jump from verse 9 to the beginning of that Philadelphia church age. By the time you get to verse 10, you're talking to the Philadelphia remnant that's alive at the end of the Laodicean period. That's us. And look what it says and we're quit. Brother Dan, read that real loud for me. Verse 10, slowly. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. Because thou, what? Hast kept. Say it. Past tense. The word of my patience. Go ahead. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. Go ahead. Which shall come upon all the world try them that dwell upon the earth. Sure sounds like the tribulation period, doesn't it? You want a good pre-tribulation rapture verse? There's one right there. Look what he says. You see where we are here? We're at the very end. We're at the cusp of the rapture. And what's he say? For those of you, because you've kept my word, I'll keep you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon them on the earth. And if you don't think that's talking about the rapture, would you look at the very next verse? What's the very next statement there, Dan? Behold, I come. Yeah, behold, I come quickly. He's a coming neighbor. Now watch. Here's the last verse I've got for you. So what's he telling us to do now? What did he tell all the Christians through the Middle Ages? Just to what? Hold fast. Hang on there. Witness where you can, but don't get, don't get nervous about any big campaigns. I understand. Something's coming down here. It won't be here to 1790, but hang in there in your generation. But look what he tells us. We've got something now that they didn't have. JPEF's been enlarged, and we got the book out of England. And look at the last thing God tells you to do between now and the rapture. Here it is. Look, Brother Dan, what's the next verse say? Verse uh, 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Okay. Uh, he'll go out no more. There's a day come when I, we'll sit down by the river. Isn't that what the song says? But here's the part I want you to see. Brother Dan, read the second half of verse 11. As soon as he says, Behold, I come quickly, he's telling you Christians, Hang on, I'm coming quick for you, right? What's the next thing he says after that in verse 11? Hold that fast which thou hast. Did he tell you to hold fast? No. He said hold. What's the next word after hold? Fast. Hold what? That fast. And what's the next thing say? That thou what? Fast. Hast. What do we have in our hands? He just told you. You've kept my word. We had it from 1611. When that preacher there makes a big deal about the King James Bible, don't ever think he's being fanatical. Hold that fast that thou hast that no man take thy crown. From here to the rapture, we don't have any more protection. We've got something to hold on to for all we're worth. And this is where we're going. Side by side, Biden and all the nuts. And who knows how bad it's going to get. God knows. And these are the perilous times. 
Is he coming for us? I know he is. How soon is he coming? Who knows? He can't come soon enough, preacher. But I tell you this, if you go to the last two verses of the Bible, it says, even so come Lord Jesus. Amen. Remember that? The last two verses of the Bible, uh, I, I come quickly, hold fast. He says, behold, I come quickly. Amen. That's how the Bible ends. And you know what's the funniest thing? I had a lady in New Hampshire say, Preacher, look at that. Look at those last two verses. It's verse 20 and 21. Wouldn't that be cool if the Lord came back and got us in 2021? You can't preach that stuff, but it sure is cool to see it, isn't it? Preacher, I'm done. Well, thank the people for listening to a long history lesson. But I thought you'd like to see what happened on January the 18th. Come ahead, Pastor. You think you, you, think you know what you need to be doing now? What do you need to be doing? You need to be holding that fast that thou hast. You know, three hymns have always been a blessing to sing. But now they jump up and like a hand in a glove. You know what they are? They are, hold the fort for I am coming. Keep on the firing line. And keep me safe till the storm passes by. Boy, those three hymns are going to resonate with you between now and the rapture. Thank you for listening so well tonight, church. It's been a blessing to preach this to you tonight. Pastor, come ahead. Let's do this. Let's all stand. I know it was more teaching than it was preaching tonight, but uh, there's a verse of Scripture that's been going through my mind the entire night, the entire message. And that is, Be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know as your labor is not in vain in the Lord. When does that show up in Scripture? That shows up in 1 Corinthians 15. And at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about rapture. And what does he tell us to do before that takes place? Be ye steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Maybe the Lord's just, just getting a hold of your heart about just being steadfast. Just sticking with the stuff whether we see the results or don't see the results that's not the issue the issue is being steadfast let's remain standing with our heads bowed and our eyes closed and god's dealing with your heart something you want to take care of tonight uh, as as the music